All right. Today we're looking at chapters 16, 17, and 18 in the book of Acts. And I'm feeling like taking a slightly different um, approach than normal. And that's because a lot of the things in these chapters are relatively straightforward to, to understand. And I think it's really important to emphasize the gravity, the weight of a lot of the stuff going on here, because especially people who may be familiar with the Bible, or even not with the Bible, some of these stories are um, pretty familiar. Uh, it's really important to kind of remind ourselves of how, just how serious, just how surprising, and how big of a deal a lot of the stuff is that we read about here. So that's what I'm gonna do. And we'll kind of work through the chapters sequentially. The first thing that is a really, really big deal <laughs> that we should not gloss over is the fact that Timothy, who we encounter at the beginning of chapter 16, is circumcised as, a, as an adult. That's a big deal. And this might seem like a bit of a contradiction or going backwards after we've just had the council in Jerusalem in the previous chapter saying that it's no longer necessary for um, Gentiles to become circumcised. Uh, there's a really significant th thing going on here. Uh, and again, this is very complex. Uh, but the relationship between people who are ethnically Jews in this new Christian community and those who are not ethnically Jews. And we, Timothy is a fascinating figure because of course his mother was Jewish and his father was a Greek. So it seems that what Paul doesn't want to happen is to be accused by people who are ethnically Jewish of loosening up on the rules of the of the Torah of the law, or trying to kind of uh, get Jews to betray or abandon their uh, heritage and their um, way of life, and so even though Timothy uh, is ha half Jewish, uh, he, the, still people know that he is his mother was was Jewish, and so. Um, Paul has him be circumcised, which is a tremendous um, testament to Timothy's commitment and I think to Timothy's desire to reach especially the Jewish people. So that's something that's going on there. Uh, we're also going to see a little bit later on in uh, chapter 18 how Paul is still abiding by many important Jewish practices. And so he's not abandoning anything. Uh, he sees his Christian faith as a continuation, and that's really essential for his witness and his interaction with the Jews. Next little thing to point out, it's a kind of a small tidbit. And of course, we should mention before I forget, the fact that Timothy does this uh, we see in verse 5 that the churches were strengthened in their faith and the increased in numbers daily, right? That's a phrase we've seen already many times in Acts. The ways that the church is growing is not accidental. It's not due to good marketing or even um, success or popularity necessarily. It's often connected to um, suffering. It's often connected to... Um, sacrificial living and the observance of, of people from the outside observing how dedicated and how committed and, and how different these Christians are. We're going to see that with the episode with the um, jailer coming up as well. So a little tidbit in um, verse 10 of chapter 16, you might notice that all of a sudden um, it switches to um, first person plural. It says, when he had seen the vision, that's Paul, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia. So now um, Luke, the, the writer, is um, 
is along for the ride. He is describing the, these events as things that he himself has also witnessed. Now, there's a really cool progression that happens when they get to Philippi. This is building so much of Acts is this outward spread from the center towards the periphery. And Philippi is not only farther away, we see this continual outward movement, but it's also a different type of city because in places they've gone to, in like Antioch, there have been sizable Jewish communities. But here, um, the community is so small, the Jewish community is so small, but they don't even have a synagogue. They're just kind of meeting by the river um, to pray. So Philippi is representing, and, and it's in uh, this, what's modern day Greece, but um, it's very much a um, different different culture than, than, than the culture um, closer to Jerusalem. And so we see this continuing spread of, of the gospel from ethnically Jewish to kind of half Jewish with the Samaritans to then God fearers who are in the temples and now um, going even farther out. And we're going to see the kind of culmination, the climax is coming up in chapter 17 with the people in Athens. But we'll get to that in a moment. Now, another interesting comment um, on Lydia and we're, we're going to see um, several times um, in chapter 17, verse 4 and verse 12, that many women are joining the church. Uh, this is something we take enormously for granted. And I want to emphasize the gravity of this. Um, because of the rights that women have today, um, It may we may not catch the significance of these women joining the church. But this was so well known that women and slaves were joining this early Christian church that um, pagan uh, philosophers and writers who were who were critiquing Christianity who were who wanted to speak poorly of it were um, one of their critiques was that it's just this religion of all these made up of all these women and slaves and it can't be that significant but at this time the reason that women are, and slaves are joining the church is because no other religious system, no other philosophy, no other place would dare, would even come close to saying that women are equally valued in God's eyes to men. That was just a monumental, it is impossible to, um, to uh, exaggerate um, or, over, or overstate how huge this is. And the fact that we we just we just take for granted that all people are 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 equal but that was emphatically explicitly not the case um in the roman world and in the and from the world of greek philosophy um plato and aristotle very clearly lay out that there is that there are different groups of people who are more superior and um women basically were seen as um like uh, failed men. Uh, I forget which philosopher it is, but basically like in the womb, they tried to become male, but they were kind of ended up being female. Um, so this is, it's, it's enormous that, um, women and slaves are accepted in this new movement, in this new community. Absolutely enormous. We cannot, um, overstate this. Um, and then along with that point is the fact that uh, I could make a much longer video about this, but we take for granted this idea of love, that love, most people would agree today that love is a good thing. We are, we're on the same page. Every group wants to claim that they're loving. Um, but that was also very distinct from the religions of this time. The gods that people were worship, that pagans were worshiping, you know, Zeus and Poseidon and Pluto, they not only they did they not love people but they were more or less indifferent they didn't really care that much about what um, was happening to humanity or or how they were faring and so the fact that paul and silas and barnabas and timothy these guys are preaching a, a gospel it really is good news about what jesus had done about jesus's victory and proclaiming it and, and talking about a God who loves and accepts people um, as they are is 
absolutely mind-blowing. It's really, really, we need to soak in the gravity and the weight of this. Um, I want to just have a quick note on chapter 16, verse 16, this um, demon-possessed uh, slave girl. Um, once again, to emphasize that at this time in this in this um, part of the world, this was a common, commonly understood people. Everybody acknowledged that there were spiritual beings um, and that this would not have been a strange or unusual thing, but this was a commonly accepted um, reality, which plays into um, other instances of demon possession and de demonic activity in the New Testament and also has to do with um, the statement about Paul when he encounters Athens and he's so he's so disturbed because he knows that Athens is under the bondage of this spiritual influence from these spiritual beings that do not love the people, that do not want the best for these people, but are deceiving them and causing them to live a life that is contrary to what God wants for his uh, sons and his daughters, his creation. Uh, I want to emphasize also just how bad prisons were. <laughs> um, we tend to think of prisons as being, I, I well, I don't know, but, uh, you know, picture them being chained, and t you know, their feet being secured on the floor, and there were um, feces and, um, you know, nasty stuff and, and rats that would eat and, um, you know, dig into your skin. Prisons were really, really nasty places. And so the fact that Paul and Silas are singing hymns to God at midnight after being severely beaten, this is a really big deal. We can't, we, we can't just gloss over this. This is a big deal. And this has to do with what I mentioned earlier, the fact that this jailer encounters people who are so, so different. They are so radically different from the other people in this culture at this time. And one, we also might miss this, the fact that Paul and Silas don't escape, okay? So that's why in verse 35, um, it's it, we are told that the magistrates um, tell the jailer, let those men go. So they're still in custody. Even though there's an earthquake and the doors open up, they don't escape. How crazy is that? And the, and the jailer is saying, there's something different about these people. And um, they don't even want him to kill himself because really if they would have escaped, that's, he would have been, he would have been killed also, or killed anyway. Um, I need to mention about, about citizenship because that comes up here. Um, if you weren't a Roman citizen, uh, you didn't really have any rights and you could just be beaten kind of, uh, you know, casually without any repercussions you didn't have any rights to a trial. And so the fact that both Paul and Silas are actually Roman citizens, now they are Jews also, but they are Roman citizens, this is a huge, huge deal. And one of the reasons why Paul is able to be so effective in his ministry throughout the um, the Roman world at this time. So citizenship was not just a um, casual thing that you'd get when you're born, you, you really had to earn it. And most often people earned it by participation in the military. Um, Few other things I can I want to say, uh, but but really we need to center on Athens. I'm going to kind of concentrate here. Um, Athens represents the the kind of, like I said the kind of the climax so far of the Book of Acts, moving farthest and farthest away from this Jewish center in Jerusalem. And Paul is n now he's not just talking in the synagogues, but he's talking in the marketplace every day. This is kind of the cultural center. This is the same place where Plato and Aristotle would be arguing and debating. And uh, these people are full out pagans, right? They're, they don't have an interest in the God of Israel. They're not attending synagogue. They're not interested in these things. And so Paul, we notice, takes a different method from, from how he has explained the gospel to um, people who are familiar with Judaism or who are ethnically Jewish. And at first he's misunderstood. Um, scholars tend to think that the reason he's misunderstood is people, it says in um, verse 18 of chapter 17, he's talking about Jesus and the and the resurrection. That word in Greek is anastasis, which is um, feminine. Uh, and it, sound, it, it seems like people are 
thinking Paul is talking about two deities, Jesus and his kind of female counterpart, um, Anastasis, the resurrection. And so they say, we, we need some more information. Paul gives them more information. He clarifies, even when they understand what's really going on with the resurrection, they scoff, they mock. And again, this is something really, really, really important to um, highlight. T tons of people have talked about Acts chapter 17. This is one of the most famous chapters in the entire Bible. And uh, sometimes people don't get it quite right. And there's lots more I could say. But what, what I'm interested in emphasizing here is just how strange this message would have seemed to people like the Stoics and the Epicureans. Um, for different reasons, both of them thought of the physical body as something that was uh, not that great. Stoics were fo focused more on kind of universal um, principles and kind of the deeper um, logic of the universe. They actually use that same word logos that John uses in the gospel. And the Epicureans are focused more on um, intellectual things and the, the purity and the, and, the, and the pleasure and, and the goodness, the supremacy of intellectual um, thoughts and kind of treasures or whatever. And so for both of these people, the body is something that's not really that great. And they're, they're looking forward to, you know, getting rid of the body. And so the fact that Christians emphasize so strongly this resurrection, that we would once again have bodies, that we'd be raised from the dead, is absolutely countercultural. And still a lot of Christians today, unfortunately, misunderstand um, what happens um, after we die or what happens after that period of life after we die, when we are resurrected. Um, but this fundamentally affirms the goodness of creation, the goodness of our bodies and God's intention to redeem what he has made, redeem what he has created and to make it um, new and to make it glorious. And as it says in the book of Ephesians, to, to prepare his bride uh, for, for this, this wedding feast, the lamb in Revelation as, as pure and, and spotless. Um, and this is not a uh, throw away um, of our bodies so that we can ascend spiritually. Uh, this is something very different. That's all I, I will say about that. One final note because of time uh, is just what I mentioned earlier, Paul sticking to Jewish traditions in 18 verse 18. We read that um, Paul had his hair cut for he was under a vow. And that is most likely a Nazarite vow, which you can read about in the book of Numbers. Um, and the other significant uh, biblical figure who um, was under a Nazarite vow in the New Testament is John the Baptist or John the Forerunner. And this involved um, abstaining from alcohol, abstaining from sexual relations, not cutting your hair. Samson is another example from the Old Testament. And so Paul is um, still very much committed to the things uh, that are part of the Jewish faith and traditions and has no problem reconciling those with what he is doing in sharing the good news and the gospel with other people. Um, I hope some of these thoughts are useful and helpful to you. Uh, I'm looking forward to digging into this much more. Um, I always enjoy our conversations after these videos. Um, so I'll say goodbye for now.